session, we're actually going to be looking beyond display. Um, my name's Katrina. I'm a museum development officer with the Southeast Museum Development Programme. But actually, for the last nearly 20 years of my museum life, I've been working on the ground in museums in learning and engagement. So I hope through this session that I can give you some ideas, some inspiration for ways in which you can actually use your archaeological collections. Uh, my most recent role was actually working at an archaeological site, um, Fishbourne Roman Palace, which is right down on the south coast. And you can imagine that there's a lot of use of archaeological collections in that role. So you'll see some examples from there as well. Now with this session, the plan is that I'll spend about half an hour giving you some nice case studies, some examples of different ways of using your collections. And then for the last half an hour, you can see we've got some activities on the table. So you can actually have a little look and have a go. Um, and there's different activities on different tables, so we'll get you sort of moving around to have a little look at those and give you lots of ideas to take away with you. Now, when you're thinking about how you're going to use your collections, it's worth thinking actually what collections do you want to use, what collections do you have? We've talked today about some of the varieties in archaeological collections that we hold in our museums. So for some of you, you've got site archive material. You've got boxes and boxes and boxes of shells, pottery shirts, iron slag. And you're thinking, what can I do with those? And hopefully this second section where we do the practical stuff will give you some ideas about that. Some of you might have material collected in the 1800s and 1900s. Often things that have come maybe from overseas. So you might have a collection of Greek pottery or some ancient Egyptian artefacts. And of course, you've got no provenance to those. And actually, they might not be very relevant to the story of your museum as it is. They might not be on display, but still you can use those in interesting ways. And some of you might have stray finds, metal detected finds, things that people have picked up and brought in. And some of you might have some of those unidentifiable finds as well. And as we said earlier, even the unidentified actually can be really useful, can be really engaging, because archaeology offers us that option to interpret, to discover what we can find out by looking at the real object. Now here you've got a kind of representation perhaps of how archaeological objects can be displayed. Some of you might have very topological um, displays, so you've got the same sorts of material in a collection, um, quite a static display like this Roman glass we've got here. Sometimes our archaeological artefacts are used as sort of almost set dressing in trying to create a view of the past. And we've got that in that middle image there. There's a view of a, a Roman gardens, gardener's hut there um, with some original Roman ceramic water pipes actually down the bottom there. But don't forget, objects can actually also be used through a display project. They can be used to create an engagement opportunity. And just on this right-hand side, we've got a series of objects not particularly interesting in themselves, but the process of putting those on display actually has engaged visitors. And with this particular project, we had visitors coming in um, to do a community archaeology project with our spoil heaps. So Fishbourne Roman Palace was excavated in the 1960s, um, and when they dug at the site, they took off a lot of the material. You can imagine not necessarily sieving at that point, not necessarily carefully um, recovering everything. The material was then dumped next to the site. And what we've been able to do is invite visitors to actually go back through those spoil heaps, go back through that material, find some real Roman finds, and then put those on display with their own interpretations. So actually, through that process, visitors were starting to understand the process of archaeology and the skills involved. And it's great to see, we've got one of these down the bottom here, I remember was a nine-year-old girl. So it was great to see her discover a tooth, clean it off, draw it out on her finds card, have a chat with the experts, look up in some books to find out what kind of tooth it was, perhaps how old it was, what it might tell us about life in the past, and then write her own little label. Very simply, she's written, tooth of a pig. So that was what she felt was important about that artefact. 
When we're thinking about engagement activity, I think it's also really important that we think about which audiences we want to work with. And archaeology is really, really good for working with a wide range of audiences. It's really robust, it offers really good handling opportunities. And as I say, there's that discussion that you can have at any level about what is this, how do people use this, what does it mean? When we think of our archaeology collections in museums, quite often we start off thinking of our um, primary school groups. It's quite often the way in which people come to museums. Primary schools come in and they say, right, we're doing the Romans, we're doing the Anglo-Saxons, we're doing prehistory, what have you got? And that's where we start. But actually, there's so much more that we can use those collections for. So rather than just thinking about that particular period in history, we can think about archaeological skills, perhaps with family groups. Archaeology really lends itself to being used with family groups all the way through the ages. With volunteers and researchers, and we've talked a bit about that already, and we'll talk a little bit more about that through this session. With adult groups, whether they're experts, groups of metal detectorists potentially, or just people out on a day trip, again, you can start those conversations. And even with a variety of audiences with additional needs, and this image in the middle bottom here is from a, a dementia workshop, so a workshop for people living with dementia and their carers. This particular session was about toys and games, so we started with some of the um, Roman counters and dice that we have um, in the um, museum, and then went on to other games and toys that we used in uh, Roman times. And that became a practical workshop that went from the artefacts into something that somebody could understand and follow and actually get a lot of enjoyment from. In a similar way, we did another one of those sessions um, with people uh, living with dementia, where we looked at marbling. The Roman wall plaster from the palace actually has marbled decorations on it. We did a marbling activity. And one of the lovely stories that came out of that workshop was one of the participants had been a printer in the 1960s and actually remember the process of creating marbled papers for books and was able to tell us quite a lot about that process and some of the technical terms used in creating those marbled papers. So it's really interesting where one object, one archaeological object, can actually take people in different situations and different scenarios. And I've just put that line down the bottom there, we are all archaeologists, because if you think about archaeology not being about digging, which of course is how visitors tend to think of it, archaeology is about digging, archaeology is about that conversation, it's about thinking about the people behind an object, and anyone can look at an object, handle it, and get something from that experience. So what I'd like to do is just go through some different audiences, some different projects from different museums to perhaps give you some ideas, some inspiration of what you could do with your archaeological collections and the audiences you want to engage with. This is a really lovely volunteer project. Museum of London, they were running it for several years. Unfortunately, it's finished now. The member of staff has moved on. But what they've been able to do is actually bring in new volunteers and people who wouldn't normally use the use museum, certainly wouldn't normally volunteer with the museum to actually work on some collections care work with their archaeological collections. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone, doesn't it? Because it gives you a chance to repackage uh, and catalogue your archaeological collections, find out a bit more about what you've got in those boxes hiding in your store. But also, it's a way to engage with new audiences. So what the Museum of London did was they went out deliberately, advertised this opportunity, they spoke to community groups, and they recruited a group of people, brought them in and explained what the project was, and then set it up so that it met not only the museum's needs, but also the needs of those volunteers. And what they found, that working sort of one day a week on a volunteer project, perhaps that's how you do your volunteer projects generally, works really well, but over a time-bound period, over sort of 10 weeks, rather than doing it indefinitely, saying to people, this is kind of the commitment that we're looking for, and that worked really well. They also found that actually working with teams, so groups of about six volunteers seemed to work really well, so that they really got that social aspect of volunteering, 
those groups would come together once a week and know what they were going to be working on. Maybe slightly different to the way you do your volunteer projects. I know in some museums I've worked, it's been much more of an individual process and people are coming in and doing the same thing week after week after week. So it's interesting to try this slightly more time-bound approach. And they also made sure there was a mix of tasks. So the volunteers were involved in collections care, so you can see the beautifully repackaged finds in their bags with their labels on. They were also involved in cataloguing the finds, both typing in information into the computers, taking notes, taking photographs. And for those who wanted to, they could get involved in public engagement activities. So from the things that they found in the store, they were able to then go out into the museum and chat to people about them. And the volunteers really, really enjoyed and appreciated that. And as part of the process, the museum brought in their experts so they're experts in animal bone, Roman glass, um, clay pipes, to do little mini talks about particular types of finds. So the volunteers were building their skills and their knowledge at the same time. And I think you can see from the kind of list of targets on the screen there, that this was more than just a one-sided project. There was a real benefit to the museum because it sorted out what was in their store, their collections. There was a benefit to their visitors. There was something else going on in the museum. Obviously, there was a benefit as well to those, um, to those volunteers. They gained a lot from being involved in the project. And there was a real benefit in terms of well-being, both for the volunteers, but also for the staff who were involved. So they felt really positive getting involved in that project. So that's a really nice one, I think. If you're a bit of a smaller museum, and it's a bit more of a challenge, perhaps, to run a big volunteer project like that. Think about starting small. Making links with your local universities or further education colleges actually can give you an opportunity to bring in people to work with your collections. Many universities are looking for placements for students and don't always think that these placements have got to be the history of archaeology students. Actually, they can come from a range of different departments. We had a student um, at Fishbourne who was looking at our tile collection. There are boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of Roman tile at Fishbourne. We wanted to do a disposal project, actually, to look at what was not needed. And that student got involved in that project. Um, and she actually went through and identified things that would be useful for handling um, and for learning programmes so that those items could be identified and moved into the learning department while other boxes of material we knew were earmarked for disposal. So that was a really easy way to use, make really good use of a volunteer um, time. This is another university partnership, which I'll just mention as well. And I said, don't necessarily just rely on the archaeology and the history departments. Make links with graphic design, IT, gaming, computer gaming. This was a link with a department that had a 3D printer. The um, Museum of Sussex Archaeology acquired this middle Bronze Age hoard. And within the hoard, you've got these rather unusual Sussex loops. They're particularly found in Sussex, as you can probably tell from the name. And because a part of the exhibition associated with this hoard was an engagement activity with sort of um, talks and outreach activities, they wanted something that the people public could handle. With a Middle Bronze Age hoard, something that rare, something that fragile, of course you can't give it to the public necessarily to handle, but a nice alternative through this partnership with the university was to create a 3D print of one of those Sussex loops. And that started a real conversation with the visitors, because rather than just passively viewing the exhibition, this was an opportunity to say, so, what do you think this is? Because actually, it's something that nobody's quite sure about. There's an assumption or a thought that this is a type of bracelet that you could wear on your arm, but is the sizing quite right? Does it fit? Can you bend your arm if you're wearing it? So actually, by having 3D prints of these kinds of objects, this is something that people can get to understand and get to know and get to start again that process of archaeological debate and discovery. So look out for who's local in your area in terms of universities and colleges. I think another key audience, 
families. We all work with families in museums, and archaeology is great for working with families. Think about the best ways to work with families, and think about how to engage families at all levels. So not just the children, but get the teenagers involved, and the adults and the grandparents. And there are lots and lots of different ways that you can do this. Object handling works really well. If you've got somebody with an enthusiasm for something, like our bone expert just here, then that's your, your day made. That's something that works really, really well. And it's simple to do. But think about also how you can just take one object, perhaps, as a focus for an activity for a family. Over here on the right-hand side, we um, did a day focusing on just one object, which was a melon bead, or our series of melon beads. Um, you can see down the bottom there, that's how they're on display at Fishbourne. In quite a traditional way, they're made to look a bit like a necklace. But actually, I wanted to open people's eyes to different interpretations and get them involved in that idea of what could these be used for? Because we don't know for certain that is how they were used as necklaces. So we had our Roman soldier wandering around the site. He's got, I don't know if you can just see it, just to kind of for the fastening of his helmet, there's a replica melon bead just there. He also had his purse with him, with a melon bead on that. We had a Roman lady also wandering around the site. She had a melon bead necklace, as per the sort of interpretation in the museum. But she also had a melon bead on her spindle, so she had that as a spindle weight as well. We had a little workshop where people could make melon beads. I have to say, we didn't stretch to faience, we did it out of clay, clay and paint. But at least gave people an idea about the sizes and the shapes and the weight of these things. And we had pop-up talks. So something that perhaps appealed um, to uh, adults or certainly to people with a bit more kind of archaeological knowledge. We talked about what these actually might be, how they were made, and what you can notice about these beads. And we used information from the Portable Antiquities Scheme website as well to actually draw parallels between other finds that are found across the country of these particular beads. So this really started to open people's minds. Rather than just seeing a set of beads and saying, OK, yeah, I've seen that, I know what that is, it raises those questions. Why are they worn in one particular direction quite often. Why are the holes so big? Why are the glass ones so heavy? What do we think these things are actually used for? And so that's a really nice, simple way that you can take one object and start to build up that idea of reinterpreting it. And it works for all levels of a family as well. And that leads us nicely on to out-of-school clubs. Because as well as all that work you can do with schools, archaeology really engages children out of school as well, whether they come in family groups or whether they're part of an organised um, school after school club. So the images at the top are from Bristol's Museum um, Archaeology um, Out of School Club. And they ran that for a term, so they went into the school, ran activities with the children. Really, really exciting, interesting activities, all about the process of archaeology. So they looked at things like a dustbin and tried to interpret exactly what had happened in that family's life from the rubbish they'd thrown away. They grew cress in the shape of crop marks, which sounds really exciting. They did a, a mock Anglo-Saxon burial. So they used those whole series of activities to engage the children in understanding what is archaeology about, how does it work, what skills do you need. And in a similar vein, the images just down the bottom there are from a Saturday club that we ran at Fishbourne, which again was for children to find out more about the process of archaeology and to get hands-on. And the nice thing about these sorts of projects is that you're seeing the same people again and again and again. So you're getting that deeper level of engagement. And certainly one thing we did with our little group, our Toggies team, as we called them, is we used them for some consultation exercises. So when we came to re, um, redo our interactive gallery, which was a, um, an HLF-funded project, we had a ready-made group to consult with, and they tried out lots of different activities and gave us ideas and inspiration for what was needed within that gallery space. So that 
deeper level of engagement is well worth um, aiming for if you can. But of course, we don't always have to think about necessarily the history, the past with the objects. We don't always have to think specifically about archaeological skills because our archaeological objects can actually be inspiration for a range of other activities as well. Creative responses, dance, drama, theatre, potentially. Those unknown objects that we talked about earlier can actually be a real springboard for something really creative. I think you were talking about literacy activities based on an unknown object. This was a really nice project run at Tunbridge Wells Museum. Um, they actually linked an artist with a pupil referral unit. Um, the artist had experience with working with community groups like this. Um, she was also a set designer. And what we did was we took objects from the museum, in this case, some Egyptian shabtis, very little known about them, apart from the fact they'd appeared somewhere in Tunbridge Wells at some point in the 19th century. And they, were, of course, were things that were usually in store. So these objects came out of the store, went to the unit, the pupil referral unit, students had a look at them, um, used them as inspiration, and actually got really, really engaged by these objects. You think of the stories of mummies coming to life and the sort of mystery and the mystique of the pyramids was something that really kind of captured their imaginations, even though if you ask them whether they've been to the museum, of course, the answer was, was no. So they used that as a starting point, sketched those, and then turned those um, pieces of creative inspiration into pieces of artwork that then went on display in the museum. So they made these sort of sets, 3D sets that are about sort of that size that went on display. And you can sort of see the link, um, the inspiration there from the museum objects. But of course, creativity doesn't have to stop with children. We can get adults involved as well. A um, couple of really nice uh, projects here, again, looking at kind of Roman finds. Um, just here, the Novium Museum invited in a jewellery um, tutor to run a course on making brooches inspired by their original Roman brooches that are on display. And the nice thing about that was that the tutor, of course, had the expertise to know how to guide the group in making the brooches using very traditional materials. So they literally hand cut out the shapes um, using saws. They used hand drills for the drilling, punches. So we're using traditional techniques as far as possible. So that gives a real sense of understanding as to how the original Roman items were made. In a similar vein, at Fishbourne, we had an enamel artist. Um, she came in because she was interested in the Roman enamel work that we had. She recreated one of the lead seal boxes that we had. Um, and then ran a course as well, so that uh, visitors, adults, could come in and do that same process of a bit of enamelling. And the nice thing, of course, about those two projects is that they also provide income generation for the museum, because adults are paying um, to go on the workshops and actually have an experience, have an involvement. Of course, we shouldn't forget our online audiences. We've talked a little bit about the benefits of social media and what we can do through them. Um, these are a couple of really nice examples, but there's hundreds and hundreds of other things you can do with um, online resources and with social media. This one here on Twitter, Archive Lottery. Has anybody seen that around? That's a really nice, straightforward um, thing that you could do almost instantly. And it, brings discoveries for you as well as your online audiences. So it started with the Museum of London again, but other archaeological organisations have got involved. The idea is that you invite people to nominate maybe a shelf, a bay, a box within your store. So if you imagine particularly your archaeological archives stacked up on your shelves, somebody nominates that box, you go down, open it up, take a photo of the contents, and post it up there, with perhaps with a little bit of information as well. And as I say, that process, interesting for the person who's nominated the box, equally interesting for the curator who thinks, hmm, I haven't looked in this box for a while, or I didn't know we had that. So it's a really good way to demonstrate what you've got in store and to demonstrate the value 
of caring for these archaeological archives as well. Over here, we've got an example from the Mary Rose, very different approach um, to online archives. Here, they've got some 3D representations of objects that are particularly of interest um, that are in the museum. Um, this particular wooden bowl has got sort of carvings and markings inside and out. So the best way to see it, actually, is to be able to turn it around. Not something, of course, um, many people can do. So by putting it online, it's accessible to a much, much wider audience. Um, and actually, the Mary Rose have done a really good job of getting their collections internationally known. And they carry out um, Skype talks um, with organisations across the world and they have a lot of images that they share with people as well. So think about who might want to find out about your archaeological collections and the best way to get to them. Finally, we'll just sort of mention formal learning. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's one of those um, areas we always think of when we're thinking of our archaeological collections. Schools will come to us and they'll want to do their topic. But see whether you can push them, nudge them, to other things that they can do with your archaeological collections. Yes, they might be doing the Romans, but had they thought of using your collections for some skills-based learning, perhaps? Measuring, measuring columns, whether they're looking at um, estimation, um, whether they're looking at materials, your archaeological collections will contain items that are of benefit to that. And think about those cross-curricular opportunities as well. And we've mentioned how you can use collections for creative purposes. We did a really lovely literacy course, um, particularly for children who were struggling with their writing. Um, and we encouraged them to write based on some of those tiles that I mentioned earlier. So you can imagine we've got hundreds and hundreds of roof tiles. Lots of them have prints on. And you've probably got these in your museum as well. Cat prints, dog prints all sorts of animals where they've walked over the tiles. Starting the children on that creative journey of thinking, how did those footprints appear in the tiles, gives them a springboard then to write some stories. And I have to say, when we've done this workshop, it's worked really, really well because it started children on that process. And they've got very excited about the story, perhaps, of the Roman soldier who was chasing the dog, who was chasing the cat. And that's why you've got this amazing collection of footprints on this set of Roman tiles. And don't forget, when you're thinking about formal learning, don't forget the teachers as well. Bristol Museums have done a series of CPD courses. Um, this one particularly, you can see, is ideal for that change in the national curriculum that happened a few years ago. So looking at giving teachers confidence with using your collections, um, perhaps for topics that they don't know so well, so prehistory topics and things like that. So, that gives you a kind of few ideas about things that you could do with different audiences. We have, I think, in museums, a couple of challenges sometimes with using our collections, um, our archaeological collections, to engage our audiences. One of our challenges is that our visitors think our stores are full of things like these lovely face pots here when actually the reality is very, very different. Our stores are full of the sorts of boxes that Kat showed us earlier. Boxes and boxes of broken bits of pot and pieces of shell and things like that. So that's one of our challenges. Actually, how do we use those sorts of things? One of our other challenges is having the resource, having the people sometimes to be able to have um, engagement opportunities, have people out in the galleries talking to visitors. So what I've got around the room are 21 different things you could do with really unexciting bits of pot. And those 21 different things, certainly a lot of them could be done without facilitation, so without necessarily having that staff resource. So what I'm going to encourage you to do now is go around the room. They're on the three tables, plus a few on the tea and coffee table. Have a little look, have a go. Hopefully there'll be some things you've not seen before, although I think some of them you might have seen before as well. Hopefully that's giving you a few little ideas, some inspiration. Um, these uh, resources are up on 
Are they up now on the SMA website? I think they are, aren't they? They will be. Or they will be. Um, so feel free to use, adapt however you want to. But the idea is that it gives you a mixture of things that you can use um, facilitated or unfacilitated with or without bits of random pot that you might have lying around. <laughs> um, and it's things that either kind of focus on some sort of historical aspect, something about the past, or something about archaeological skills. So think about actually what would suit the audience that you're working with best. Now I'm just going to finish with the last slide here, um, just to kind of give you an idea really about how best to plan your engagement activity. Um, what I find is really useful for planning an activity is actually the generic learning outcomes, um, which you'll find on various uh, websites. It's been around for quite a long time, but it gives you a focus as to what you want people to get out of your activity. And have a think about it. Do you want them to perhaps come away knowing something, get some knowledge? Do you want them to develop a skill? Maybe one of those archaeological skills, using the rim chart perhaps. Do you want them just to have fun? actually. Over there there's an activity where you ice biscuits and then put in your lines, look like a Bakewell tart um, pattern. Um, clearly that's a nice enjoyment activity, so maybe that's what you want to get out of it. Or is there something you want to encourage people to do in terms of um, something in the future, their behaviour or their attitudes um, towards archaeology? Think about, as we said at the beginning, who your audience are, how you're going to deliver it, is it going to be facilitated or not, um, any particular stories that you want to bring out, and the objects you can use. Um, here, the pieces of pottery we've got are all um, completely unstratified finds. Um, there's not a lot, actually, of research value within those objects. If you do go out down into your store and you've got your archive material, just check is it something that actually is really, really useful to a researcher? Don't divide up the box to use it for an engagement activity if it's something that actually a researcher might come in and want to see as a whole. And then think about who else could help you with your activity. Because as we said, you're not in this on your own. There are plenty of people around who you can help. You can invite in your flow for a start to do some activities with you as well. And just a few, list of a few useful links, sources of support. Um, do approach your local museum development team. They are full of lots of useful information and they often have grant pots as well, small grant pots that you can apply for. Um, the CBA website um, and the Young Archaeologists Club also provide lots of exciting engagement activities and resources that you can use. Um, that's the link for that archive lottery that I mentioned and, of course, the SMA, as we've said all through today, is a really good source of ideas, inspiration, help whenever you need it. Are there any questions? Lovely. Thank you very much.